afternoon, everyone. Today, I would like to talk about uh, the mechanistic machine learning for engineering and applied science. So in this first lecture, we would like to first provide an over, overview about machine learning applications for mechanics problem. So um, before we talk more about machine learning, the first thing we may need to define is what is learning and what is the what is the more uh, regular definitions of learning. So here we will use the definition from Hubert Simon. So learning is any process by which an entity improves performance from ex ex experience. So for example, uh, if we, we can think about uh, how Newton discovered the first law, uh, we see, we observe the trajectory of the apple falling from the tree and that uh, sensory data uh, allow us to deduct a very simple mathematical equation f equals to ma and that uh, process um, in this process the observing the trajectory of apple is actually the, ex the experience that uh, newton has and then the process is to generalize uh, and then the learning process is to have us generalizing this uh, into f equals to ma in a sense the machine learning uh, is actually uh, um, uh, a process similar to the human learning in which case we want to rigorously define a specific task with a specific uh, experience and there's an established matrix that are measured by uh, that actually measure the values of the performance and the machine learning process is designed such that uh, over time with more D we want to perform the task T that are actually improved over time that are measured by uh, established uh, matrix that are actually P. So machine learning problem is considered successful if the task can be performed better with the increasing uh, experience. And in real life, in mechanics worlds, um, this is not actually not guaranteed and the course that uh, we're going to talk about is actually about how to we is how do we actually obtain success from those attacks, uh, from those uh, specific design of new network or machine learning procedure. So um, the first questions we need to ask ourselves is why we need to perform the machine learning. There, there could be many reasons. Um, for example, um, we can think about this um, in a computer simulations, one of the most expensive procedure is not necessarily the HPC com computations, but the implementations of the model. Now the machine learning may not help us automate all of the process, but it may help us to find a more uh, implicit way to actually program a particular procedure that have us finish the job. So um, if this is the case, we can actually um, not only can we overcome a loss of bottleneck, then we can save time and then the time we save can allow, allow us to tackle a more complicated tasks. Um, I think uh, in this community, we can already see a uh, lot of applications in, uh, in uh, <clears throat> engineering using machine learning. I'm by no means an expert of these uh, applications. I just want to point out the large and diverse spectrum of applications that the machine learning is now, are they, they are increasingly important role. That include in zebra engineering, smart city, uh, material modeling uh, with new network uh, for uh, new material property for topological optimization, CO2, 
geological uh, storage or predicting uh, making predictions in oil industry and even predicting earthquakes. So um, at the beginning of the um, of the melting of the AI winter, there have been a lot of promise uh, that are given in the machine learning. So this is actually some code here, a breakthrough in machine learning with Reward and Microsoft. Uh, machine learning is a new hot thing. Uh, you hear this all the time. Uh, machine learning is the new internet. Machine learning is new file. But a lot of time, the deep levels of the application is in the details. Um, in particular, whether we can deploy uh, engineering applications that are precise and safe and not uh, risking uh, um, applications that are high consequent or high regret. It uh, would be an important topic uh, that are particularly unique in the mechanics and engineering applications. So to give an example, if you make a prediction on, um, on recommending uh, uh, item for shopping, uh, a less accurate predictions may make it, the company lose money, but they may not directly cause uh, life being lost. But for engineering applications, if you're replacing a conventional constitutive law with a machine learning uh, constitutive law for design, um, or, or incorporate it into the building code. We better make sure that the predictions is not only accurate, but are very robust, or maybe in some cases even less robust, but we can guarantee a minimum of accuracy. And so this is actually the time figure for machine learning. This is two years ago, and as we can see, um, uh, life is a little bit moving on um, from uh, the timeline right now. Um, I think there is a peak of the excitement that coming from the self-driving car and uh, that are actually uh, deliver some promising results. Um, right now, we cannot be in the, in the slope of enlightenment or the pattern of productivity. And the machine learning uh, applications that we are trying to make uh, getting get increasingly uh, sophisticated uh, with the new GPU and TPU design. Uh, but then the early uh, excitement, I think, is only to say that as a little bit wear down uh, recently. And also, as you can see from that figure, um, the, the maturity of uh, different machine learning techniques uh, vary by topic by topic. Uh, I would like to uh, confess that I'm not a uh, necessary uh, expert in machine uh, in uh, neural network or, or computer science. So in this course, our focus is mainly on how to apply those more mature techniques or the promising technique to make uh, engineering applications of deploy um, the, the machine learning technique that could be for uh, engineering applications. So uh, again, I'm going to talk about the big picture here. So in a traditional uh, programming, um, we would actually have data and program and we have the computer and then we actually would generate the output. Um, for example, um, if we want to calibrate a material law or we want to um, identify the, we want to actually create a label for a particular image, we would actually, uh, we will actually have the data uh, after we run the, after we write the program, we will actually have the data ready and then the data tell us what is actually the, uh, the, the answer that we want. Okay, so say we want to hard code, um, uh, say we want to hard code uh, um, uh, constantly law, for example, we would actually, uh, uh, we actually need to have a program that only tell us this what kind of Yas modulus, Poisson ratio, we will assume this is linear, uh, and then we actually uh, calibrate it uh, 
for a given model, there's some flexibility for us to tune different material parameter uh, for a different model. Uh, a damage model can allow us to capture damage, but not plasticity. But then those uh, range of the mechanical behavior are actually uh, encoded in those parameters that are given to us. So, um, and, uh, and in a traditional workflow, we calibrate for the constitutive, we calibrate for the material behavior uh, from the data. And once we are actually able to do that, we can put it in the computer to run the simulations. The major difference between the traditional programming and the machine learning application is that in the machine learning applications, we have the data in and in, at least for the supervised machine learning, we have the data and we have the output. And we are actually trying to use the learning algorithm to create a program. And once we create a program, we can go back to our traditional modeling without explicitly writing all the program. Okay, this work uh, for supervised learning, uh, for unsupervised learning, you probably doesn't have the output, but you try to use the data uh, to help us obtain a low dimensional predictions, but then the same thing. And for the reinforcement learning problem, the philosophy is very similar, except that uh, we were repeating this progress multiple times and use the data uh, or the reward we accumulate to improve the program uh, iteratively. So this is just a procedural code that we find it from the internet just to give the, us a general idea of the different um, programming philosophy. Uh, in the traditional approach, uh, we basically uh, would explicitly program every details. Okay, we would say that if we uh, given a certain situations, what is the best reactions? Uh, if we pay walks, uh, paper scissor, if you see a walk, obviously we program a paper, blah, 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 and then we would actually just need to hard code everything. Okay. In a machine learning approach, the programming is more implicit in the sense that we are not going to directly uh, divide our actions, but we are actually using the law functions to, to actually create an informed uh, decisions or train the new network uh, to make the, or, or, or whatever um, learning algorithm to create the right, the correct response that maximize uh, um, our ob our objective um, merit uh, reward system or minimizing the loss. So in this particular case, uh, this is, would be a supervised learning setting. So uh, the input would be a pair of, uh, would be the pair of the actions and then uh, by the first pair and the second pair. And then the judgment is whether the first pair uh, a win or loss. And then using this data that record the win and loss, uh, the, the, we are actually trying to create a right label uh, so that we know uh, how to react to, so the algorithm know how to react to a certain uh, input in the environment. Uh, so there are also another important philosophical uh, uh, um, concept that I actually need to understand and that become in increasingly important is the ability of the machine learning predictions. So, um, uh, this is actually just one uh, analogy. So, so the left hand side is actually a mechanical duct. It has a right input and right output as a real duct, but it's not necessary uh, a represent the real animal. Okay, so if we create a back box reaction, sometimes we get the external behavior exact, but then uh, it may the predictions may come from a completely different causality. And having the wrong causality in the machine learning predictions can lead to uh, new predictions so that are actually um, not necessarily correct or, or at least not rigorous. And, um, and so in the machine learning world, there are also way to, uh, there are also recent trying to increase the instability and also restore the causal discovery. Okay, so the cost itself 
here. We may not able to cover all the details, but this is something that uh, very important that uh, we need to be aware of. Um, and we will talk about how we can actually make sure that um, uh, when we create a predictions um, that are for mechanics problem, at least, how do we guarantee that uh, the mapping from the input and output are as physical as possible, possible to guarantee uh, some uh, additional constraint. Well, another analog is actually related to the perceptions. This is actually the dark web figure. So you can basically see the web and then the dark here. So um, one of the important thing we would like also like to um, talk about uh, later in the lecture is to how to enforce predictions that are actually um, give us a robust uh, prediction regardless of the coordinate system and regardless of the deception. So if there is only one ground truth in that sense, uh, then we should either see, we should only see rabbit or a duck, okay? But if we actually are uh, trying to predict uh, uh, the perceptions of the human, then the coordinate system itself may actually affect our judgment. If we align these two vertical lines, we may see a more like a duck-like figure. But then uh, if you actually look at it in the, in, along with these two lines, we may more likely to see the weapon. So, uh, so what I want to say is that the internal behavior and the external behavior uh, is, uh, are actually uh, two of the necessary conditions to help us make uh, the correct predictions. And, uh, and for mechanics problem, both of them could be important. So uh, basically, we would like to talk about the component in this short course, uh, regardless of the representations. How do we uh, effectively represent high dimensional data? The proper way to evaluate the system uh, based on some loss functions, how do we write the loss functions? This is an area uh, a lot of researchers uh, actually not paying enough attention but that will be important for lots of mechanics problem okay if you want to actually uh predict some things that are actually good so how do we define good and mathematically represent it and also the optimization problem or how do we solve the optimization problem a lot of time we will just use n atom why does it work and uh, in what case we cannot do it Okay, one clear example is that if we don't have a continuous space, such as if you try to make a discrete uh, decisions or a combination of discrete decisions and continuous discrete uh, decisions, how do you get away with that? How do you formulate the problem so that you can search for the optimum choice uh, based on the data that you have? So, um, we would in this course we will talk about both the conventional data representations how do we use the auto encoder you basically can find a lot of information in the literature and here we don't have to uh, repeat ourselves one particular case we want to talk about um, uh, by me and also uh, my colleagues uh, js chen is actually uh, the more non-traditional data, such as metaphor, graph, how are we going to actually create a low dimensional representing representations of it? And when does those low, low dimensional representation fail to make a good predictions uh, and how do we get over it? So this is something we will talk about. Uh, in particular, in one of the lectures, we will talk about the graph uh, neural network. Uh, I think you can see it from a lot of uh, different range in civil engineering. For example, we all deal with graph. We probably just don't know the name. For example, trust system, bean system, they are all can be considered as the edge graph or node way and edge graph, polycrystal, okay? And even for transportations, the the spread of the of the COVID nineteen, uh, they are all related to uh, some spatial relationship that are not necessary in a continuum, 
but in a discrete manner. Okay, with multiple finite destinations connect by the edge. And in this case, there is a benefit to consider where even though we, there is a multiple way to represent the same data uh, on non-traditional way, whether to capture it uh, as a graph could be beneficial. Okay, and the same thing for the low linear elasticity. Traditionally, we actually create the predictions um, by considering the vector space. Okay, but uh, but if you look at it uh, for low linear elasticity, um, you may actually see uh, you may actually get a benefit by uh, some benefit by considering it as a metaphor and then uh, equip with a norm that are actually changing yeah, in different in the coordinate. So this is something that we may we may cover. Uh, in terms of evaluations, we would like to talk about the common way to model it. What are the possible choice and how do we, how does it relate it to the future predictions? Okay, when we run, for example, a supervised machine learning, we are making the assumption that the data distributions are actually sufficient, and in that case we may use the accuracy as a way to measure the success of the new network. Okay, but something that uh, also get, um, but there are other, uh, also other um, uh, important criteria to consider the physics constraint, for example, um, the, the quality of the forward predictions, um, and also the difference between the, the expect values of the earlier and then the extreme case. So those we would actually consider. Basically, there are at least three optimization problems that we need to be aware of and we need to use it in very often. The first one is for discrete uh, decisions. The, the, that are, for example, uh, those uh, involve uh, making choice, uh, and then uh, we need the um, we need the, the uh, we need the algorithm that can help us make the script choice either by solving the minimum spanning tree or or actually using the greedy search to find the good combination of the script choice. Uh, that may happen for very often in design of experiment where we are often tasked with making different choice instead of tuning something in a continuous space. In a continuous state, there are two very important concepts, the COMEX optimization, which is I think most of us uh, um, attending this course would be very familiar. We try to find the minimizer or maximizer in a continuous space. Okay, in this case, uh, it looks very trivial, but how do we parameterize the same space may make a di big difference on, the, on how easy or difficult it is for the optimization problem that we would cover. Another major issues that are very important for the success of the machine learning problem for mechanics is the constraint optimizations. In particular, if the if the, there are multiple criteria that are that in conflict with each other, in this case, uh, we need to actually find a way to solve uh, or at least trying to find the pendle the funds problem or, or the pendle dominant problem. Uh, that means that if there's a multiple objective, how do we fulfill all of the objective as much as we can? without finding the local compromise solutions that are less optimal. In some case, uh, a, a global a good solution may not exist. In that case, uh, how do we find, trying to find a good compromise? Uh, we would also briefly uh, cover that. Okay, so as I said before, um, the first one is uh, more commonly encountered in reinforcement learning, but you can also see it uh, from um, Matter happening is often related to the uh, decisions making. Uh, in the in the decision making problem, um, how do we actually uh, create the instructions or uh, the type of uh, um, uh, input that actually allow us to maximize the norm? The difficulty here is that uh, 
we are dealing with uh, discrete space so that there is no gradient objective uh, there is no gradient optimization we can use and we need to use other strategy to help us evaluate the choice and then to make a good choice so a uh, very good problem is the tic tap toe problem um, in which we are given a state and then we try to uh, and then we try to evaluate what is the the values of uh, of each decisions that allow you to figure out which way is a win or lose. Here, this is actually uh, we pick the almost the end of the game. We only have three spot left, and you can simply design in each strategy uh, if you pick a choice how does the game develop uh, in uh, in. Uh, in all the possible way, and we can find out which way you can win and which one you cannot win. For example, in this case, this choice would actually not be very ideal because there's no chance you can win here. Versus uh, this choice is probably the best strategy because uh, you only have the winning, uh, winning configurations. So the, we will cover the, that concept in the reinforcement learning. Um, the current status, for each move, it's actually called a stay in a, in a, in a market decisions uh, process. And then uh, another action is actually the, the action where we actually put the, put a new move on the, on the, that contact allow us to uh, transit from a previous state to a current state. And then the reinforcement, the goal of the reinforcement learning is actually uh, find out what is the right path for us to maximize the reward that uh, we define in this case a win or lose. Now, obviously, in the last step, we obviously know which configuration will give us win, but the challenge in that uh, reinforcement learning problem is to back propagate that reward function to the earlier decisions. So uh, we will talk about the constraint uh, and the convex optimization. So obviously, in most cases, um, a data uh, that lead to a loose functions that are highly oscillated are much harder to solve than some smooth data. And this is something that um, uh, a very important issue is that if there's a noise or oscillations, or maybe the data itself have multiple criteria that are lead to a settle point or constraint optimization problem that doesn't lead to a minimizer. How do we actually design the learning problem? How do we do such that uh, you, you can, we can still find a minimizer? So in a feed forward uh, neural network, uh, the way and the bias they keep changing and then by changing it, we are actually, you can physically imagine that we are somewhere in this uh, loss function landscape and then our goal is to find the minimizer that I, that make the loss as little as possible but in each of the in each time between the way and the bias we would actually put ourselves into a new point but then the the, the key issue is that we don't actually know what is a loss function look like and then the, the, the training is to actually, you can visualize the training as someone um, trying to hike, hiking and then trying to find the lowest point by, uh, exp uh, by experimenting a uh, different path. Um, uh, another important issue is that we also would like to talk a little about it is the, the balance between the demands to optimize uh, uh, a global problem and then to, but also encourage explorations. So this is actually a good analogs. Uh, I think it's kind of self evidence. If, we, if uh, the mouse may want to get the cheese, but then avoid the penalty. So how do we do that? This is actually a Costco constraint optimization problem. So our goal in this one day course is to cover a little bit of all three of these surprise learning and surprise learning reinforcement learning. Obviously, each of these topics can demand, can probably take anywhere from one semester to one year to be uh, the true master of it. Um, in the one day course, it's unrealistic that uh, by the end of this course, uh, we would actually have a be a master of this. 
uh, learning. But here, uh, what we start trying to do is to show some of the example to show the direction which we believe is promising and hopefully stimulate uh, more thinking or, or uh, um, and more future directions. And also, I was saying that uh, at least from my own perspective, I'm sure that there are many, many researchers that have a better um, idea on doing one or multiple tasks. But we are simply picking an example we think is working, but it, uh, there, the, the best way to approaching this is actually problem dependence. And then there may uh, obviously could be a better choice than what we present here. Our goal here is simply present something that uh, very simple and working uh, for some limit case and hopefully the, and that would generate the interest to the audience and then we can think about how to, um, how to generalizing this to a uh, better um, prediction uh, for the for a better engineering applications. Um, I think by now everyone should understand supervised learning. Um, we I was asked very frequently since I started doing the machine learning research back in 2018, what is the difference between regressions and the machine learning? And I think in some case, the machine supervised learning is during the regressions, uh, in particular, if you use the feed forward network. But their major difference here is that the, unlike the classical regressions, in the machine learning task, usually we are dealing with uh, data that are more, of much higher dimensions. And in that high dimension, it's really difficult to do it with the classical mean of uh, conducting the regressions without having a loss of error. So the neural network or other things like support vector machines or convolutional neural network, there are tools for us. A lot of time is to, to handle the high dimensional data. Sometimes we project it into the low dimension space that we can handle. And then from that, we make the regressions, okay? So the machine learning is probably, I would consider it instead of just uh, four or five regressions, it's more like a tools to help us to conduct some of the tasks, uh, including regressions, including estimations, estimating the probability estimations or classifications, in particular for high dimensions. I think this is actually um, one of the important distinctions between the classical method and, uh, and, uh, and the new work. And of course, that is related to the fact, uh, I think that related to the fact that uh, the, 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 the groundbreaking paper on the back publications um, of, the new, of the neural network. Uh, I would also spend some time to talk about the reinforcement learning. Uh, this is actually, uh, I feel like the course is more complete if we talk about both the continuous uh, problem and the discrete problem. In here, the discrete doesn't mean that we're doing DEM or something that are actually uh, mechanically discrete, but we are, uh, I would like to also talk about the case where we are, the learning problem itself is not necessarily suitable to, to model the entire um, program or, or, or learn algorithm as a mapping or as a continuous mapping. So in this case, uh, what are the tools available? What is the best way to do reinforcement learning? Again, reinforcement learning itself is a very difficult topic. So or maybe I will say it's a very difficult, but a very uh, a very important topic that can go really that probably even one year won't be uh, sufficient. So here we will just present something in a rather superficial manner yeah, and then to talk about the big picture idea with the Jupyter code to show a working out problem. So if you want to actually learn more, I think that the Google DeepMind uh, provide a very good training. So I recommend those uh, who are in serious about this to look at those uh, uh, course uh, instead of just uh, relying on this, but you can actually play around with the with the modeling problem that are uh, done by my uh, former student uh, Dr. Kun Wong. Uh, I think that um, it would take a lot of effort to learn those things, but of course um, 
there are lots of uh, applications and then the application space keep expanding. Uh, you can find the machine learning uh, solution deployed in transportation engineering, in uh, designing meta material uh, for so predicting constitutive modeling. So, or, or and kind of small, uh, lots of them are, but all of them, I would say have a similar nature they are some high dimensional data and we are at that are actually too overwhelming to, uh, to handle manually. So the classical way is we, uh, to, to handle those data is to either describe it in a qualitative manner, saying that we discovered physics because of A or linking the B to C. Uh, and then we use the descriptor to describe those uh, phenomena or we just abandon the high dimensional data. Uh, so the machine learning great, great promise in, in the light, in, the, in my, my background is on combination of solar mechanics. In that solar mechanics, we do have a large amount of mechanical data, micro CV data, digital image correlation data. And usually um, and we can easily see that uh, a manual or, or handcraft solutions or to interpret those high dimensional data are very difficult, if not impossible. So what we hope is that that course can uh, help you to get a general idea of what uh, machine learning from a problem, uh, machine learning solution can be applied for mechanics. Uh, and I hope that this will be useful. Thank you.